Mercy. More and more people are talking about it in the context of the masses of Americans we incarcerate. But is mercy enough? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, a man who's done a lot to push this debate to the forefront, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And later in the show, we find out how your community can be part of his history marking project. All that and a few words from me on the high cost of isolating not just our prisoners, but our prisons. Welcome to our program. Our next guest has dedicated his life to work at the intersection of race, poverty, and the law. Brian Stevenson is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, dedicated to helping the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned, also us. Under his leadership, he's won major legal challenges, eliminating excessive and unfair sentencing, exonerating innocent death row prisoners, confronting abuse of the incarcerated and the mentally ill, and aiding children prosecuted as adults. Brian's initiated major new anti-poverty and anti-discrimination efforts that challenge the legacy of racial inequality in America, including major projects to educate communities about slavery, lynching, and segregation. Among his many awards are the MacArthur Foundation Genius Prize and 16 honorary degrees. He's the author of the critically acclaimed bestseller, Just Mercy, which is recently out in paperback. Brian, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So, Brian, with all of your many, many degrees and books, and you're a genius after all, <laughs> look into the future for me. And how far do you have to look to see a society, our society, dealing with this question of justice differently? Well, I think it's in different components. I think the phenomenon of mass incarceration is something we could correct in a very short period of time. It took us 40 years to get from a prison population of 300,000 in 1972 uh, to 2.3 million today. Uh, I actually think that if we end this misguided war on drugs, if we begin to deal with drug dependency and drug addiction as a health issue mm -hmm. rather than a crime issue, if we eliminate mandatory sentencing, if we commit ourselves uh, to helping people recover, and uh, to correct and to rehabilitate, I think we could cut the prison population in this country in the next six to eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we've got a million people in jails and prisons who are not a threat to public safety, who are there for simple possession of marijuana or for writing a bad check of $100. And I think we could actually, in a very short period of time, bring down the prison population by a million. We spent $6 billion on jails and prisons in 1980. We spent $80 billion last year. So if we cut the population by 50%, we'd arguably have about $40 billion to then spend on the other aspects of our justice system. But we would still, and the New York Times pointed out recently, we would still be incarcerating more people than anyone else in the world, even if we did away with the drug war and, and the death penalty. Uh, absolutely. We still have a lot more work to do. Uh, but I think if we got to the point where we brought down the prison population and we realized that we were no less safe, and we realize we don't have to engage in the kind of excessive, punitive, harsh responses that have defined our nation mm -hmm. over the last 40 years, then I think it would be easier to imagine ending the death penalty and eliminating uh, life without parole. But I also think it would be important to have those dollars redirected into a new kind of intervention, mm -hmm. where we start treating all of the children living in households uh, where they are born into violence and they're living in violence and they're chased by violent gangs and they're traumatized. Uh, where we'd start investing into solutions to deal with the structural poverty and structural despair. You know, I work in communities where I talk with 13 and 12 year old kids who honestly tell me that they don't expect to be free by the time they're 21. And it's not an irrational fear. The Bureau of Justice now reports that one in three uh, black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. So I think if we created a new environment uh, that is fueled by the reduction in jails and prisons, we could start talking about some of these other issues. And I, I am persuaded that in my lifetime, we could imagine, we could actually achieve a very different environment mm. when we start talking about social justice. All right, so I want to get back to the new environment yes. and the 40 years. But yes. before that, you, your book, Just Mercy, is rooted in people's stories. Mm. And, I, and I wanted you to tell just a couple. Mm. Um, early on in your career, somebody tells you, um, capital punishment. Those who don't have the capital get the punishment. Mm. How does the story of Walter McMillan sort of 
illustrate exactly that point. Yeah. Well, I do think one of the challenges that we have in this country is that we have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Yeah. Wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. And Walter McMillan was an indigent uh, black man in uh, South Alabama who was wrongly accused of a murder. Uh, and he was largely accused because he was having an affair with a young white woman. He was African American. And, um, uh, you know, they couldn't solve the crime. And the pressures that we now put on law enforcement to solve crimes, to arrest the bad person, are so extreme that frequently they don't care whether that person is guilty or innocent. That's what happened to Mr. McMillan. And even though he was at uh, his home raising money for his sister's church with dozens of other people who could verify his innocence, uh, he was arrested, put on death row before trial, uh, stayed on death row for 15 months before taken to trial, convicted. And, and just stop for a second, because people may say, huh, what do you mean? Why was he there before he was even convicted? The, they, they wanted to create a narrative about his guilt, his dangerousness, and so they actually uh, put him on death row. And so the papers would say, death row defendant Walter McMillan will be arraigned next week, will be uh, prosecuted next week. And it created this idea that he's so dangerous that we can't even keep him in the normal jail. They coerced people to testify falsely against him. Uh, they took him to trial. Uh, all of the people who were with him, uh, who t came forward to say he's not guilty, were ignored. Yeah. And based on the testimony of one or two people, they convicted him. They actually gave him a sentence of life without parole, the jury. Uh, but the elected trial judge, whose name was Robert E. Lee Key, uh, overrode the jury's verdict and imposed the death penalty. And of course, the irony of Mr. McMillan's case was that it takes place in Monroeville, Alabama, which is the community where Harper Lee grew up and wrote the famous, beloved American novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. And we love that story in this country. We read it. If you go to Monroeville, they celebrate it. All the streets are named after characters in the book. Uh, they put on a play about it each year. They are preoccupied with that story, but were completely indifferent to the plight of an innocent black man being wrongly convicted. And as you point out, he was also barely literate. Barely literate. Like many people, he was the children of sharecroppers. Uh, there were no schools for black kids in the community when he was a little boy. Uh, and uh, he was demon.